just want to say happy Father's Day to all the fathers here today. And we're so excited that you are here uh, and taking time out of your schedule, your day, as your family honors you to be in the house of the Lord. I think that's so important and it says a lot about you and your character. And so thank you for being here. And uh, we just pray and I want you to know from my heart to yours that we believe in men. We believe in men. We believe in the fathers. You guys, we as fathers have, as Pastor Josh already mentioned, like a responsibility. And there's so many fathers today that are lost in culture, lost in society, and lost in their families. And, and uh, the families have taken a hit because the fathers have taken a step back. And it's our role, it's our responsibility as fathers, um, you know, to take that stand before the Lord and say, as for me and my household, we're going to serve the Lord. And we're going to take that responsibility. And God honors that. He honors that not only in your life personally, but he'll honor that in your marriage. He'll honor that within your family and your kids. And so I just want to thank you so much for being here. And we encourage you. We believe in you. And we're so glad that you're part of Propel Church. So... Before you leave today, there will be a, a, a slight, small treat for you, your choice of a candy treat, and you can choose what you want. There's about five or six different choices, and I, I've forgotten all of them, but I, I won't name them. But I, just, just as you know, as you walk out, there will be ushers there, and please feel free to take uh, a candy, and we just say we love you, and happy Father's Day. All right, we're going to continue with the series that we started back uh, a couple weeks ago, and it's entitled Our God Is, and we're looking at some of the different names of God, and we're trying to understand and look again and be reminded that God is known by many different names to describe his character and nature, and because of the different names of God, it's just not um, there for our, our sight to read and just to take it as, as such, but it's really to honor and understand who God is. It's there for us to understand not only who he is, but that we should be growing deeper in love with God because of who he is. And it should draw us that much closer in our relationship with the Lord. And so that's my prayer. That's my hope in this series that you'd be encouraged. You would know who your God is, that you would understand and grow closer to, you, to him through your relationship with Jesus. And so today we're going to look at that God is called Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord will provide. The Lord will provide. You might be familiar with this particular name of God, knowing that God is our provider. He's the one who provides for us. But the other part of the meaning of Jehovah Jireh is this. It means the God who sees ahead. Or in other words, God sees our need up ahead and he will provide. That's the, the complete meaning of Jehovah Jireh. And so God knows what we need even before we need it. He knows what we need even before we do. He can see the need and he can provide for it in his perfect timing. And being Father's Day, let me speak to the fathers for a moment. We as fathers have a sense of providing for our family. We take on that burden. We take on that responsibility that, man, we've got to provide for our family. And so a lot of times we see the needs of our family. We see the needs even before our kids may see the needs that they have in their life. And we desire as fathers and we work hard to meet those needs. And as a provider of our family, we as fathers sometimes see the needs that even our children can't see that they have. But yet we see them as a father and we know that they need that need to be met. And so we can see the situation and knows, we know what needs to happen. And so we will work to provide an answer or solution for the needs of our kids. Well, our Heavenly Father loves us. We have a Heavenly Father who loves us more than He could ever love us. And it never stops. He loves to provide for His kids as Jehovah Jireh. Even more so than what we may even love to provide for our kids. That's who God is. And Abraham experienced God as Jehovah Jireh when God had asked him to sacrifice Isaac, his son. And I want to look at that account today, that story. It's a familiar passage. It's one that is very standing out. It's almost like the point of, wow, that's, that's incredible faith on Abraham's part. But he knew God as Jehovah Jireh, and he knew that God would provide. And so look with me, if you will, at Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 through 8. It says, sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied, then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain, I will show you. 
Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. And when he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. And he said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied, the the fire and wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? That's the million dollar question right there. And Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. So it says here in this passage that sometime later, after Isaac was born, God had tested Abraham and his faith, his faith in the Lord. And so God called Abraham and told him to offer his only son, Isaac, as a burnt offering on the mountain that God would show him. Now, I don't know about you, but that's pretty difficult to think about. Okay, why would my God, the God that I serve, the God that I love, ask me to sacrifice my only son? How in the world could he do that? And we see here in this passage that Abraham took a three-day, one-way journey to Mount Moriah, which was about 50 miles from where Abraham lived in Beersheba. And when they arrived, Isaac and Abraham went up the mountain. And it says that Abraham placed the wood on Isaac, like as if Isaac has to carry his own wood and sacrifice that he's going to get, right? Right. And so Isaac, knowing that they were going to sacrifice a lamb, began to ask his father, hey, dad, where's the lamb? I mean, I see the resources we have. I see the wood. I see the the fire. I see the knife, everything to get going on this altar. But where's the lamb? And Abraham's faith didn't waver. He trusted God in this moment. And that's why he told Isaac, he said, God was going to provide the lamb, my son. And the two of them continued on together. Now think about it for a moment, but that must have been one long walk up this mountain, not let alone the three-day journey to get there. And verse 9 says that when they reached the place they were supposed to be, Abraham built the, the altar and he bound Isaac to the wood as the sacrifice. And then he took a knife and raised it to sacrifice his son. Now think about this for a moment. It's not like Abraham got to the top of the mountain and said, okay, God, I've been faithful all this way. I've taken the three-day journey. I brought wood. I brought the resource to make a fire. I have a knife. God, I've, I've proven myself. Now, do we really need to go to the point of building the altar? And yet, Abraham was completely faithful in that moment. He didn't question God. He didn't stop. He didn't wait for God to come and provide any type of lamb at that point. Abraham built the altar He put his son on the altar. He bound his son to the altar. And can you imagine what was going through Isaac's eyes in that moment? Like, Dad, what are you doing? What what are you doing? Why am I the second? Why are you you killing me? I'm your only son. And Abraham follows through all the way to the point of raising the knife, ready to sacrifice. And God intervenes in that last moment. And he steps in and sends an angel to the Lord and said, Put down the knife. Don't harm the boy. Don't do anything to him because I know that you love God, that you truly fear God more than you would your only son. And then Abraham looks, and I want to continue within verses 13 and 14 of Genesis 22. It says, Abraham looked up, and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its thorns. And he went over and took the ram, and he sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of a son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. So Abraham, again, finds the ram in the thicket of the brush. And he sees God's provision in that moment so that he wouldn't have to sacrifice Isaac, his son. And Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide, or he was calling that place Jehovah Jireh. That God had seen my need and he will provide. He did provide in this moment. And he says in here, it's written here. And in Israel, it's declared that on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. 
I want to remind us today that God is the provider for everything that we need. I'm going to say that again because somebody needs to hear that. And you're, you're in a situation right now where you need to know God's provision. God is the provider for every single thing that we need. He is Jehovah Jireh. And God is the source of our provision. He knows every single one of our needs and he will provide for them as Jehovah Jireh. He wants us to know him personally through Christ, to know him as Jehovah Jireh, the God that will provide, that he sees ahead of time our needs, and he will send his provision within our lives. And he's already made a way for all of our needs. I want to dive into the story a little bit because what's so amazing or special about Mount Moriah is this location that Abraham built the altar to sacrifice Isaac was eventually the place where Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem was going to be. Why do you say that that's so important? Well, about a thousand years later, David provided that same site where Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac. He provided that same site for his son Solomon to build the temple. David had purchased that threshing floor of Iran of the Jebusite. And when Solomon built the temple at that same place, the temple became the place where sacrifices were offered to God. On the mountain of the Lord, God will provide. Representing God's provision of forgiveness for sins. But the most amazing thing is this. Jesus was crucified at Calvary or Golgotha, which was just outside the walls of Jerusalem, not far from the place where Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac. Think about that for the moment. God knew what he was doing when he told Abraham to go to the mountain that I'm going to show you. And as he and Isaac climbed Mount Moriah and Isaac carried the wood for the altar that he would lay on, God was foreshadowing when his only son Jesus would carry his cross from Jerusalem, from Mount Moriah to Mount Calvary, yeah. to Golgotha. God was saying, this is what I'm going to do. On this mountain, God will provide for all of us. Abraham just didn't experience God's provision in that moment. We all experienced through the, through the prophetic foreshadowing of what was to come. Abraham was declaring that God will provide. Prophetically saying that on the mountain of the Lord, a perfect lamb will come and be provided for all of us. God saw our need for a savior even before Abraham and Isaac ever came to be. Even before they went and climbed this mountain. And God in his perfect timing provided a savior through Jesus. God is faithful to provide for everything that we need even before we need it. That's why he's our provider and he will step in even at the last moment like he did with Abraham and Isaac. From this scripture, we can learn several things. And this morning, I want to look at these different several things in regards to God as Jehovah Jireh. The first is this. Sometimes the Lord will test us to see if we trust him to provide. Now, we don't like that. Why would God test us, right? That's not fun to hear and understand that God may test us or he may be testing us in the moment. But God tested Abraham to see if he could trust God as provider. And that was not an easy test. But Abraham's faith in God was strong. He had a confident assurance that God was going to come through. And Abraham feared God or followed his ways in reverence to him. In fact, to fear God means this. It means to reverence God as sovereign or to know that he is in control. To trust God implicitly without any doubt or reserve. And to obey God without any question. That's really what it means to fear God. And that's what Abraham did that we read about in Genesis 22. And sometimes the Lord will test us to see if we, that we can really truly trust him. That he will provide for our situation. That he will provide for our needs. Now God's not wanting to torture us. He's not trying to harm us. He's not trying to put us through misery. That's not his intentions because that's not who he is. He loves us. But he will test us at times in his sovereignty to help us grow and to know him as Jehovah Jireh. So that we would come to learn, that we would come to walk with him completely surrendered to his provision and to his timing in our lives. 
There may, be, there may be times that God may ask us to sacrifice the dream or what we love. God may ask us to surrender the dream that he's given to us, to surrender the gifts and talents that God has given us or placed within us that are from him, to surrender the things that we love most in our lives, just like Abraham loved Isaac. Really to see if that if we are willing to do whatever it is that he's asked of us. To see that if we fear him by reverencing him, trusting him, and obeying him without question. That's why we even have baby dedication or child dedications, understanding that, yes, this is like the biggest blessing in our lives to have a brand new life within our home when we have a child. But yet in turn, we know that this child ultimately belongs to God. And so we in turn give that child symbolically saying, God, this child is just not for our blessing, but it's ultimately your child. And you have a plan and a purpose and he or she's life. And so God, anoint my child, anoint my son, anoint my daughter for your purposes. God, I surrender that child back to you. And many times God will give back that which he's asked us, surrender, asked us to surrender or to sacrifice. Just like he gave Isaac back to Abraham. But God is looking for the heart or the life that is completely surrendered to him. And not only when it's convenient to surrender to God. But that's where true trust comes in to know God is our provider, even when it's not convenient or fun. We see, we see two things out of this passage in Genesis 22 when it comes to sacrificing or surrendering the dream that we have or, or, or what we love. And the first is this. Surrendering requires faith. To surrender to God completely requires faith. And when we surrender to whatever it is God's asking of us, it takes faith on our part. It may be the dream that he's placed within us. It may be that thing that we've longed to do for the glory of God. And God may ask us to surrender it back to him. We can't allow our dream in that moment to become more important than our God. Amen. And that's what Abraham had to walk through in this moment. Was he going to put Isaac before God or was he going to put God before Isaac? And he chose right and he chose wisely. But that's why he's mentioned in Hebrews 11 which is known as the faith chapter. In fact, it says this in Hebrews 11, verses 17 to 19. It says, by faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. And even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. You see, Abraham resolved in his mind, even before he took the journey, even through the journey, even when he was walking up the mountain, even when he was binding his own son or bounding his own son on top of that altar, he had already reasoned that God could bring him back to death if he had to go all the way through with that sacrifice of worship. You see, Abraham embraced God's promises even as Pastor Josh mentioned just during the ministry time. That was so fitting. God's given us many promises in his word. And we have to step out and stand on the promises of God, which unlocks the answers of God's provision in our life. Abraham knew that God could raise Isaac back to life as almighty God. The second area in surrendering to God as our provider is this. Surrendering requires worship. Surrendering to God requires worship. We read in verse 5 of Genesis 22 that Abraham told his servants to stay put when they arrived at Mount Moriah. In fact, he told them he and Isaac were going to go over to a certain spot in worship, and then they'd return to them. First of all, Abraham was confident that both he and Isaac would come back because he said, after we worship, we're both going to come back to you. We'll be back, is what Abraham was saying. You see, his faith was strong in the Lord that God would provide another sacrifice instead of Isaac. But with this, because of Abraham's love for God, this was an act of worship to God yeah. as he laid his son on the altar. Abraham is going to be completely obedient to God no matter what. In other words, Abraham wasn't going through the motions right. of worship. He wasn't pretending. He wasn't going to partially do part of it. But he was going all the way through to say, God, 
I'm going to be obedient to you as a form of worship, as an act of worship to you to sacrifice my son. It was about worshiping the one true God that had his life and Isaac's life in the palm of his hand. He knew who his God was as Jehovah Jireh. He knew that God was going to provide. And understand that we're all in need at different times in our life. We all experience need within our life. Sometimes needs are greater than others, but we all experience need in our life. And when we're in need, we have to remember, we, or we must not forget to worship God. We can't forget in the moment because we're so consumed with our need. And what's going to happen? We can't forget to spend time in God's presence worshiping his holy name. Lifting up the name of Jesus to focus on him, to honor God as our provider, to honor God as Jehovah Jireh, because he's the answer. He's the solution to all of our problems, as Abraham knew out of this passage. That's why it's so important, church, that we remember when we come together on Sundays to worship Jesus corporately, that whether we're in need in the moment or not, that we enter our times of worship together with hearts that are humbled to him. Hearts that are full of surrender before God. Not just standing with our hands in our pockets, not just reciting words on the screen, not just going through the motions to bide time, but this is our moment to worship God because we love him, because we reverence him, because we fear and honor him, and because we want him to know that we understand who he is as Jehovah. That we understand what he did through Christ for our lives. We worship God because of who he is. We don't just worship God because when we have a need and we need to come before him and we need him to provide, but we worship God because he's worthy of our praise. And when we live with that mindset, when we live in that way, in that part of our relationship with the Lord, that God, I'm going to worship you no matter what because you are worthy of all praise. You are worthy of all my praise. I'm not going to just stand here with my hands in my pocket just reciting words off the screen, but God, you are worthy of my praise. You died for me. So no matter if I have a need today or not, God, I'm going to worship you just because of who you are. When we worship God, when we live with that worship mentality and lifestyle, that's when God provides and steps in all along the way. Because we get it. We understand who our God is. And we're honoring and loving him like Abraham did. When we truly worship God with a surrendered heart, God steps in and provides for our needs. Because he knows that just like he knew with Abraham, that Abraham loved him, he can see our hearts and lives and go, they get it. They love me. The Apostle Paul gives us insight as to how we can go to God in time of need and what we receive even in our time of need. He says in Philippians 4, Four through nine, he says, rejoice in the Lord always. And I will say it again, rejoice. He says, let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And Paul goes on in verse nine to say, whatever you've learned or received or even heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. The first thing I want us to see here out of this passage is that we can have joy even in need because God will provide. Even when we're, when we're in the middle of needing an answer and we may be desperate in that point, we can still have joy within our life and with our relationship with the Lord. Understand that we choose joy. Or in other words, joy is a choice. We can live in the joy of the Lord in spite of our circumstances. That's why we're reminded here to rejoice in the Lord always. And he says it twice. We must choose to be joyful in all circumstances because the joy of the Lord is our strength, Scripture says. Happiness is based on everything, if everything is going great in our life. But joy is based on knowing that the Lord is in control. That's right. 
that the Lord has my back, that the Lord will provide because he's Jehovah Jireh. That's where joy comes from. And so we choose in that moment to live in faith and and rejoice because God is going to come through because we know who our God is. That's again, that's a great reminder why we need to know the names of God so that we understand that in spite of my situation, I can still have joy because God's going to provide. The second thing Paul tells us is don't be anxious ever. Don't be anxious ever. At any time, don't be anxious is what he's saying. He said, don't ever get caught up in the anxiousness. And we all have been there. We all have done that. Been there and done that. And that's why Paul's reminding us here because we have a tendency within our lives, within our flesh to be anxious. To get nervous, to worry about our problems and all of the what if scenarios. What happens if I don't get the provision from God or this doesn't come through, then what? And we begin to go down this path of thinking like it could be this or it could be that or and we blow up this scenario and it started at this point and now all of a sudden in our head it's our problems are this big. Why? Because it all started with anxiousness and it started with worry which only makes it worse. In fact, the devil wants us to be anxious. He wants us to be worried. He wants us to make our problems bigger than our God. He wants our nerves to be on edge so that we, he causes us or we cause ourselves to lose sleep. And we're always thinking about our problems to the point where we can't function, we can't walk in the abundant life that Jesus came to bring us because we're so concerned and focused on our problems. Amen. And so we have to make the choice when the moment of anxious thoughts creep in and we, and we begin to worry that we're not going to give in to those thoughts. Instead, we take those thoughts captive as scripture tells us. And we make them obedient to the Lord and we declare with our mouths that I'm not giving in to those thoughts in Jesus' name. But I'm declaring that God is my provider. Yes. I'm decreeing that Jehovah Jireh will make a way because that's who he is. Because he's already seen my need up ahead and he's already provided. I may not have seen his provision yet, but he's already provided. And so I'm just going to wait. I'm going to rejoice in the Lord. I'm going to choose joy because God is my provider. And the joy of the Lord is my strength. It seems so easy when we just talk about it like that, right? And it's not as easy sometimes we walk it out, but that's what God calls us to. Abraham had to walk this out. And just like Abraham, we have to walk out through every situation, through every need to understand that God will provide for us no matter what it is. And with this, Paul said, we must present needs to God with a thankful heart. Meaning this, we don't come to God with a heart or attitude that demands him to do something. We come to God with a heart of honor and reverence in which we present to him or tell him all of our needs with a thankful heart, a joyful heart, knowing that he's going to provide. Why a thankful heart? Because a thankful heart is one that understands that God is Adonai or the Lord over our life instead of our problems. And we're thankful because God hears us and he will answer us. He answers his children when we come to him with a right heart. He hears us. He hears your prayers. He sees the tears. He sees the frustration at times. But you can't allow the frustration. You can't allow the problem to become so big that it blocks our view of who God is. That it blocks our relationship with the Lord and trusting him and putting our faith in him over our need. And we surrender to him in that way. And we take all anxious thoughts captive and we present our needs to God with a heart of thankfulness. And then we can live in God's peace even before he provides. The peace that passes all understanding. Meaning, I haven't seen God's provision yet, but I know he's going to provide. The need's still there, but I'm at peace because I put my faith in God. I've come with, to him with a thankful heart. I've presented my requests in prayer and petition before the Lord with a right heart. And I'm thankful and I have joy. I'm choosing joy because I know that my God's going to provide. That's when the peace comes in. And we can walk and live in the peace of God even when we're in the midst of the storm or in the midst of need. God's peace will transcend beyond the situation no matter the size of the need. 
so that we're not consumed about how our need will be met, but instead we're consumed with God. I'm going to say that again. We should not be consumed with our need and how it's going to be met. We should be consumed with who our God is. As Jehovah Jireh, as our provider, because we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that he will make a way. He's going to provide for our need. So I want you to know this morning, peace comes through trusting in the truth that God is our provider. Paul gave us a list of things in verse 9 that we read to dwell on or to constantly think about in times of need. And I just want to look at the first one for a moment which is whatever is true. We should always think about whatever is truth. We should dwell on whatever is truth. Well, we know the Lord is truth. We know Jesus is the truth, the life, and the way. And so we need to dwell on that he is truth. We need to dwell and choose to trust in the truth that God is our provider. We're going to dwell on that. No matter what size our need is, no matter if we haven't seen the answer yet, we're going to choose to dwell on the fact that, you know what, my God's greater than my need. He's going to provide If he did it for Abraham, who spared his son's life, he's going to do it for me in this situation. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he's no respecter of persons. Paul said the God of peace then will be with us no matter what we walk through. So we have to choose to trust in God as our provider. We must live in this truth. Why? Because this truth will set us free from all anxiousness and all worry and will bring in the peace of God within our hearts and lives. And at the end of this list, Paul says that whatever we've learned or received, whatever, whatever we've been taught, whatever we've learned out of God's word or whatever we've received or even see him writing about here in scripture, that we need to put it into practice or we need to, li- we need to live it out. So we need to dwell on the truth of who God is, is what he's saying along with all the other things in that list. Later down in the same chapter, I shared verse 19 last week for our offering encouragement last Sunday, and I want to read it again. Philippians 4, verse 19, it says, And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Please understand again that there is not one need that God won't meet. There's not one need that will go unmet that God will not meet. God is able, he can, and he will meet all of our needs. Sometimes we buy into the lie or we think that our needs are bigger than God. Come on. We we can be honest with ourselves. Sometimes we think our needs are bigger than God. And that our problem is too complicated for God to work out. God, there's so many working parts and details, and this has to happen for that to come into play, and then this has to happen after that, and God knows it all. He's a creator of the world. He's a creator of our lives. And if, if, if he can do that, then God for surely can provide for our needs and all the little details and all the timing of things that need to fall into place for us to receive and walk in his provision. God knows that. And there's not one need that he can't meet. And sometimes we think that God doesn't care about us, which is a lie from the enemy. And we have to guard ourselves from that lie. But let me remind us that through Jesus, all of our needs are met, the scripture says. Not just salvation, but our physical, our financial, our emotional, our spiritual, and every other need that we have in our life will be met by Jehovah Jireh, will be met by our God. This is God's promise to us if we have a right heart and life surrendered to him. So that's why whether, no matter what need we have today, or no matter what need we will encounter down the road, we need to take that key of God's promise here. God will meet all of our needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. All of our needs. All of him. That's who our God is. He's a heavenly father that loves us more than we can ever imagine. And he will meet all of our needs. I want to close and encourage us today with a verse in Psalm 37 that David wrote. It's verse 25 in this chapter, and he says, I was young, and now I'm old. Yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging bread. David was saying, now that I'm old and I'm writing this, all throughout my life, whether I was young or whether I was old, I've never seen someone who walks with God and puts their faith and trust in him, and yet not have their 
their needs met. David was saying, God cares. David was saying that he doesn't forsake the righteous. He won't leave those who are following after him, like Abraham was, and say, well, okay, well, I'm going to let this need go by, and I'll catch the next one. God doesn't say that to us. That's why we have to understand and get our heart and our mindset correct in the truth of who God is and the truth of his word to make sure that we are following after him and we are walking in obedience to God and we are trusting in the truth of who God is as well as his promises for us that he will meet all of our needs because he will. So we don't need to worry. You don't need to fear. You don't need to seek another solution because our provider is Jehovah Jireh. We serve the God that will provide. It's not past tense. It's future. He will provide because he sees our need up ahead. And when God does come through with his provision, we must realize this. Where God sees and provides, he should be seen and praised. Where God sees and provides for our lives, he should be seen and praised. As Jehovah Jireh, God sees our need even before we see it, and he will provide at the right time when we need it. And when he does, we have to make sure that he is seen, meaning that we see and recognize or know that God is the source of our provision. It wasn't our employer. It wasn't some check that came in the mail. That was God. That promotion was from God. That blessing was from God. And so we have to make sure that we recognize God in that moment. We have to honor him. We have to worship him. We have to praise his name. We have to make sure that we don't just walk off and go, wow, that was awesome. Great. God needs to get all the credit because he's our provider. And he will provide for every single need that we have in our lives. Come on. That's God's promise for you and I. That's who our God is through Christ. And it's through Jesus that we can know him in that way. It's through Christ. Man, how good is God? He's so faithful. He's so good. And I don't know what need you have today, but God knows. He already knows the entirety of your need. He knows all the details. We just have to be faithful to say, God, you're Jehovah Jireh. You're the Lord that will provide. Maybe you're walking up the mountain today. You're going, God, I'm walking to, I feel like what's the end of this situation, and I don't know how it's going to end. It looks ugly in the moment, but God, I'm trusting you. And you have to take that need, and you have to put it on the altar and say, God, I'm thankful today. I'm choosing joy. I'm rejoicing because you're the Lord that will provide. And God, I'm giving and surrendering this with a heart and an attitude of joyfulness and thankfulness, knowing that you already see my need and you're already going to provide. So God, I'm trusting you. God, my need is not bigger than my God. My God is greater than my need. That's what the Lord wants us to take away today and to walk in in his goodness and faith. And it says Jehovah Jireh. Yeah, would you bow your heads as we worship the Lord here?